on July 16, 1945 at 5.29am, history took an irreversible turn. In the desolate expanse of the New Mexican desert, Kenneth T. Bainbridge initiated the firing unit on gadgets. The ensuing explosion painted a mountain surrounding the test site in a blinding purple and white light for 10 seconds, which witnesses claimed was brighter than the midday sun. The fireball engulfed 6,000 tons of desert and created a 7 mile tall mushroom cloud that hung ominously in the sky. Upon seeing this, Bainbridge turned to the man next to him, Robert Oppenheimer, and stated, Now, we are all sons of bitches. This event marked the birth of Trinity a seismic shift that introduced humanity to the forces locked within the atom. This newfound energy, while capable of innovation and progress, also held the capacity for unprecedented destruction, altering the course of scientific discovery and warfare forever. Oppenheimer, the visionary leader of the Manhattan Project, the group behind Trinity, later expressed the weight of the moment with the quote, He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed, few people cried, most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. These words carried a realization of the colossal power their creation had harnessed, power both to create and annihilate. But once the dust settled, they had more work to do. Within two months, they created two new atomic weapons, called Fat Man and the Little Boy. Fat Man was much like his predecessor, Gadget. It was a Mark III implosion bomb a complex sphere of explosives surrounding a ball of plutonium. The explosives had to be detonated at precisely the same time to produce a highly accurate and symmetrical implosion to allow for the plutonium sphere inside to reach critical mass and release the power within. Little Boy in comparison was a much simpler and in turn safer. The Little Boy was a gun type nuclear weapon. Inside was a barrel. At one end was a cylindrical plug of uranium-235 and at the other end was a hollow sphere of uranium. The explosive would shoot the plug into the hollow ball, which would allow the uranium to reach criticality, and set off a nuclear explosion. The cost of this comparatively simple setup was inefficiency. The reaction would set off as soon as the plug started to enter the sphere, meaning it would explode and destroy the fuel before most of it could even enter and release its energy. This inefficiency was proven on August 6, 1945, when Little Boy was dropped onto Hiroshima, as it fell, the explosive charge at one end of the barrel fired at 1,500 feet off the ground, flinging the uranium plug into the hollow sphere. As it entered, only 0.7 grams of uranium was able to fission. The rest was obliterated by the explosion. This means a piece of uranium that weighed less than half a piece of A4 paper leveled a city and killed 140,000 people as a direct result of the blast. You would be forgiven for thinking that Fat Man must have been weaker in comparison due to the fact that it managed to kill 70,000 people when it was dropped in Nagasaki, 70,000 less than Little Boy. But the truth is even more surprising. When Fat Man was dropped the 9th of August, it missed its intended target, the Mitsubishi torpedo plant, by two miles, instead landing in the Urakami Valley, which due to the fact it was surrounded on three sides by hills and mountains, it managed to contain the blast to some extent. If the bomb had hit its target, in the center of the city, it is likely that 200,000 people would have perished instantly. As a result of the bombings, Japan surrendered promptly. America had won, and most of the scientists behind the bomb's creation left Los Alamos and pursued other projects. America believed that their traditional military power was unnecessary since they were the only country capable to be armed with atomic weapons, and estimated it would take over a decade for the USSR to create one of their own. They cut their military spending by 90% as a result in the coming years. Instead, they focused their attention on international power politics. 
In the aftermath of World War II, Europe was in disarray. America had provided the modern day equivalent of $173 billion to Europe to help rebuild their leveled cities and crippled economies. They created trade routes and agreements with the European countries, which ended in commitments of protection. At which point, the USSR actively sought to infiltrate or target nations to advance their global influence. These efforts to claim territory in Europe following Germany's defeat fed into the belief that the USSR intended to expand communism across Europe. Watching this take place, America began to fear a communist Europe, and in turn they developed military plans to push them out of Europe if necessary. Planners from the United States, Britain and Canada worked together for years and drew up plans and expanded on them repeatedly until eventually they landed on Off Tackle, an obscure and buried plan that was lost to the annals of time. This plan was simple and devastating. They would use American bombers to drop 220 atomic weapons on the USSR and to wipe it off the face of the planet, with 72 more as reserves just in case. It was brutal, but it would eradicate the threats of global communism. Then, in 1947, David Lilienthal visited Los Alamos to try and get a better understanding of how it operated. He was appalled at what he saw. The buildings were basically crumbling at the seams, the roads were unpaved and muddy, and the equipment was not up to the task. Most shocking was the plutonium cores were stored openly in cages at an old ice house. Lilienthal later stated that visiting Los Alamos was one of the saddest days of my life. The United States government was under the assumption that they were one that sat on a pile of nuclear weapons that were a golden ticket to winning any conflict, but now Lillian Fall had to tell Truman, the substantial stockpile of atom bombs we and the top military assumed was there, in readiness, did not exist. Furthermore, the production facilities that would enable us to produce atomic weapons in quantity also did not exist. The number of atomic bombs in possession of the United States was the most closely guarded secret of the time. It couldn't even be written down. Lillian Fall traveled to Washington and met with President Truman and informed him that if the United States were required to go to war with the USSR, they would have at most one nuclear weapon that was, in quotes, probably operable. Upon this realization, the government turned its attention to revitalizing Los Alamos and re-establishing its productivity. Streets were paved, cutting edge equipment was procured, substantial funding was allocated, and modern storage facilities were erected to accommodate nuclear materials. These extensive renovations breathed new life into Los Alamos, enabling it to meet the production demands of the United States government. Over the course of several years, the facility amassed the arsenal required to fulfill its objectives. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, the Soviet Union was making strides of its own. In 1949, just four years after Nagasaki, the Soviet Union conducted its first successful nuclear test, the RDS-1, codenamed First Lightning. A marked beginning of the USSR's nuclear arsenal, the world had now entered a new phase of the Cold War, characterized by the terrifying prospect of mutually assured destruction. The development in the Soviet Union and the United States had cast a shadow of uncertainty across the globe. In the aftermath of the atomic bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the unleashed power of nuclear weapons demonstrated the devastating potential for destruction that science and technology could yield. As nations grappled with the ethical dilemmas posed by these new capabilities, the Cold War emerged, a global struggle defined by the precarious balance of power between the United States and the Soviet Union. The creation of atomic weapons not only altered the trajectory of warfare, but also reshaped international relations. The rapid pace of scientific advancement, as evidenced by the successful Soviet nuclear test in 1949, led to the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, an uneasy equilibrium that had kept the world on the edge of uncertainty for decades. However, the Soviet Union's swift progress in nuclear development was not solely the result of scientific brilliance. It was instead fueled by a web of espionage that reached into the heart of the United States' most secretive laboratories. Spies operating within Los Alamos covertly transferred crucial scientific research, including the innovations behind the Mark III implosion bomb. This clandestine effort accelerated the Soviet nuclear program and turned the Cold War into a perilous game of technological catch-up. The story of atomic weapons is a testament to human ingenuity, ambition, and the moral questions that arise when wielding such power. 
As we reflect on this chapter in history, do not forget the lessons learned, the lives lost, and the urgent need for global cooperation to ensure that the destructive potential of nuclear weapons remains a lesson of the past rather than a threat to our future. Thank you for joining me on this journey today. If you found this video informative, be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more content. As we continue to explore the depths of human possibility, remember that the pursuit of science and discovery comes with a responsibility to wield our achievements wisely. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you in my next one. Until then, goodbye.